Oh, you're live, Jason. Hello, everybody. It's good to be live. This is Jason Evans Growth, digital media librarian from NC State, and welcome to AV Geeks at the Hunt Library, not at the Hunt Library. This is our 13th semester of the series, which partners NC State folks with Raleigh's AV Geeks to discuss vintage educational and classroom films. So, as usual, Skip Alzheimer, who will be taking over hosting duties as, duties as soon as I relinquish them. He's the founder of AV Geeks and an NC State alum. He has been for the last few decades collecting film made throughout the last century, mostly 16 millimeter educational training and other sorts of how to movies and does an incredible job sharing them with the world. He currently houses over 36,000 such films at the AV Geeks archive here in Raleigh and shares them as stock footage for films and exhibits, research material, and during public events such as this. Uh, so today's theme is let's talk about air pollution. And we're very excited to welcome our guest, Assistant University Director of the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, Aranza Zoo Lascarain. Um, we're delighted to have her with us today. As Assistant University Director, uh, she ensures that NC State's host agreement with the USGS is being carried out responsibly and meeting the goals and objectives in their scope of work. She also oversees the Global Change Fellows Program and undertakes partnership building for the Southeast CASC. She has a broad background in environmental conservation and resource planning, has worked for city, county and state agencies in the West on water quality management and endangered species protection. She's worked in environmental education in the South Pacific Islands and international climate change policy, has a bachelor's from the University of California, Berkeley, and a master's from the University of Oregon. Aranza Zoo is a first generation immigrant from Mexico, is fluent in Spanish, and takes great pride in using her native language when working in Puerto Rico. So before we get to our distinguished guest and host, a reminder that over 200 of AV Geeks compilations are available for checkout from the libraries. You can also visit avgeeks.com or search for AV Geeks in YouTube or archive.org for more. So Skip, take it away. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, all right, I'm gonna make you go, go away. Goodbye. We'll see you later. See you in Facebook. All right. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to watch, I'm excited about this because um, we get to watch old films about pollution. And as I was saying before, I um, did a show called Last Time We Were Green, which uh, showed films from the 60s and 70s that were all about ecological concerns. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the issues related to uh, air pollution, noise pollution, litter, um, water pollution. Uh, and a lot of the films are very uh, apocalyptic, basically saying that we were destroying where we were living. And it seemed like there was a, mo a movement to clean that up. And then something happened. And so maybe we can talk about that today. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show is going to be a film um, that was made in 1958. It is a, a, a little segment of a film from the Bell Science series. And it was um, <clears throat> called Unchained Goddess. And basically that film uh, was shown on television along with the other Bell Science films and features Dr. Frank Baxter, who has actually got a PhD in English. Not, he's not a scientist. Uh, and they're explaining basically the climate and explaining how um, the atmosphere works, uh, what is controlling the atmosphere, what is controlling weather, all these aspects of that. And in the course of it, in, in the last like 15 minutes or so, they talk a little bit about uh, how we can change, we as humans can change the climate and experiments related to that. And there's a kind of a cautionary little segment in there. And so let's go ahead and watch that cautionary little segment that they managed to kind of get right, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. Here is a segment of Unchained Goddess. Even now, Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than 6 billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps.
And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottom boats would be viewing the brown towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. All right, so that's a short little film, um, a little segment. The whole film itself is about an hour, and it ran on national television, and uh, it also was distributed to schools. And why am I unable to... Well, hold on, I'm trying to get you access here. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Sorry, Zoom. I was just complaining also about Zoom issues. Um, see if I can get you spotlighted so we can actually see you and we can talk about this. Um, all right, let's see if that works. Okay. Um, hopefully that worked. All right, so what is it? Um, so this is 1958. And Skip, I'm just completely like flummoxed that like, you know, this was put together in 1958. I mean, that's so early to be talking about, I mean, in, in such a public way about um, about humans control of the atmosphere and of, of climate. Um, you know, in 1958, you know, around the 50s is when we begin to start to monitor uh, emissions in, in a real way uh, with the observatories in Mauna Loa. And so I was just really just amazed um, by sort of the, the excellent sort of science communication um, done by, uh, what, what's his name, Mr. Research, you know, the, this, you know, elegant, you know, respectable older white man talking about the science. Uh, and that humans can actually be modifying uh, the climate system. Um, so it's just amazing to me that this is happening in 1958 um, and that it would be aired in primetime TV. Um, you know, and I, I, I think a lot about sort of, uh, you know, in the age of sort of misinformation, you know, the role that this, this, this documentary um, plays in society at that time. Um, so I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that, Skip. Um, well, so era. You know, as I was saying, like when, when they talked about, um, air pollution, they talked about what you could see. Mm -hmm. They talked about smog and the, the dangerous aspects of smog. Then it changed a little bit where, where they were talking about, uh, sulfur dioxide and acid rain and and the the negative impact on trees and things like that but it was all about things that you could see and things that you could smell mm -hmm. and not about carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and so it's interesting that's what kind of struck me about this that's right i mean but they also just got the science um down really well and really succinctly i mean the fact that they showed sea level rise and they did that animation you know of the gulf of mexico in the southeastern u.s is so spot on. And then, you know, the glaciers melting. I mean, those are those are two of the important criteria we, we continue to monitor today, you know, surface air temperature and sea level rise. Um, and and they just they just hit on it, you know, in the late 50s. Um, and so, you know, I always think like, you know, well, what happened <laughs> since that time? Uh, and how are we still debating in some circles uh human caused climate right. yeah and so what what i think is interesting is that there was also kind of this thing i guess was happening in the 80s and 90s talking about the ozone layer mm -hmm. and about the fact that there were these hidden chem these chemicals that were eating away at the ozone layer and trying to tell people like okay you know what ozone layer is actually really important as far as ultraviolet rays and things like that but even then it was still, I saw, I would read about like, oh, well, we're trying to limit, like corporations and industry lobbyists are trying to not make carbon dioxide something that they have to regulate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, oh, well, we all, we breathe out carbon dioxide, so it can't be bad for us. Right. Um, it can't be bad for the environment because we, you know, we created ourselves and that's a natural thing. 
right and, and desperately trying not to have that regulation take place um, yeah even to, today i think i so oh. I, I just saw with the carbon tax uh mm -hmm. thing was trying they were trying to make it unconstitutional or declare it unconstitutional in canada yeah. and yeah. it was actually declared that it was constitutional that's right that's right and you know and i think it was only in 2007 you know you know, not that just a few years ago that we had the Supreme Court case, Massachusetts versus EPA, where, you know, Massachusetts finally asked, you know, is carbon dioxide a pollutant or not in order for us to begin to regulate it and do something about it? Um, and and the Supreme Court said, yes, yes, if the EPA cannot prove that it's not a pollutant, then it's a pollutant. Oh, interesting. And so um, so there we are. And that was in 2007. Right. All right, so we're going to go back again in time, uh, 12 years after the uh, uh, Unchained Goddess came out, uh, 1970, um, and you were kind of interested in what what year specifically, so we can talk about why this. But this is uh, the American steel industry basically saying, hey, we're, we're not bad. <laughs> we're not bad for the environment. Look at all the awesome things that we've done. Uh, so here is uh, In Quest of Cleaner Air. The of the air we breathe and the water we use is a subject of continuing concern to all of us. It is a subject we cannot avoid. For all of us, by the fact that we live and breathe, are sufferers from and contributors to pollution. Wherever a summer rain washes loose soil into the stream, wherever fuel is burned to generate power, wherever new construction disturbs the lay of the land, the inevitable, unavoidable result is pollution. About one-sixth of the total air pollution we contend with in this country can be traced to industrial processes. Improvement is difficult because a rapidly growing population demands an ever-increasing volume of manufactured products. Nevertheless, progress is being made. A leader and pioneer in the movement to stem the rising tide of air and water pollution is the steel industry. The making of smoke was once an inseparable part of the making of iron and steel. But by the start of the 20th century, simple dust catchers, the earliest form of air quality control, were being installed on blast furnaces. Research and willingness to commit major resources to minimize the pollution problems of steel making have brought dramatic progress. Air is vastly cleaner around steel mills today as a result of the hundreds of millions of dollars the steel companies have spent to develop and install cleaning systems. These complex and expensive facilities, many of which are 99% effective in removing dust particles, have brought vast improvements in the air environment of the nation's steel producing cities. Another major improvement has been brought about by the rapid conversion to the basic oxygen process. This system permits the objectionable airborne products of the steel making process to be collected and precipitated from the air before it is returned to the atmosphere. Almost half of all the steel produced in the United States is made this way now, and the percentage increases each year. Air quality control systems on the VOFs and other types of steel making furnaces capture thousands of tons of particulate matter so that it never enters the air. These devices are expensive to build, operate, and maintain. They make no dollars and cents return on the investment, but they provide indisputable evidence that the steel industry is doing something effective about air pollution. Another basic raw material of steel making is water. For years now, since the 1930s, steel companies have been conducting research programs to develop the systems and equipment necessary to improve water quality. Large intake facilities are required to meet the water needs of a basic steel producing plant. For every ton of finished steel produced, something like 20,000 gallons are needed for cleaning and cooling purposes. For example, mill scale, which forms on the surface of hot steel, is removed with high pressure water. The scale and water goes into settling pits. The scale settles out and is recovered. 
Huge clarifiers trap and remove oil, sludge, and other potentially harmful ingredients. Excess heat is dissipated in large cooling towers. The result is clear, clean water, which can be recycled back into the mill for another round or discharged into a lake or stream where more often than not, it enhances water quality. Settling basins, thickeners, scale pits, filters, separators, waste lagoons. All of these have a single purpose, to make American Steel Plants examples of one industry's efforts to help preserve our nation's waterways for all the purposes they must serve today and for generations to come. The American steel industry's investment in clean air and water is rapidly approaching $2 billion. The return is not measurable in dollars and cents. It is measurable in a better human environment. We are proud of our progress. It will continue. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, Steel Industry, for all you've done for us. <laughs> that's right. That's right, Skip. Yeah, and I, I wanted to kind of peg it to a, to a particular decade or year. Um, that, that's why I asked you about that, to see sort of what was going on in the consciousness of the country um, at that time. And I think you said early 70s, maybe, or late 60s. 1970 was the actual year, okay. supposedly. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, you have, you know, this 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 conscientization of the country, right, in the you know, that, that time period, the early 70s, you know, Silent Spring, uh, the book by Rachel Carson, uh, uh, Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, so you had this sort of awareness, this this ethos coming about about um, the necessities to have clean water and clean air, and so it's interesting that the steel industry puts this forth. You know, this is 1970, and here we are still. You know, in in the second decade of the 21st century, you know, the steel industry, you know, is almost 10 percent responsible for the emissions worldwide emissions today. You know, and and so, you know, they talk about like, you know, the scrubbers and containing dust, you know, and of course, you know, there's a further understanding of the size of particulate matter. Right. So uh, they, you know, in those days, they might have been thinking about a certain level size of particulate matter. But as we've evolved in the sort of the air chemistry, um, you know, we've we've delved even into finer, as you say, the unseen you know, the heavy metals and whatnot that still continue um, to exude from the steel plants. Yeah. Um, so what other industry, you said uh, steel industry 10%, what are other ones that have those double digits that are big industrial? Yeah, so there's transportation sector. So if you just, if you just put together the transportation sector, the cement industry, the steel industry, and the uh, sort of the uh, the heat generation plants that together is probably in the range of seventy five to eighty percent of the emissions right there. Interesting. So still a significant amount, you know. And we still talk about carbon capture and storage as a potential to capture that carbon before being released. But the you know that's when markets come in and cost benefits come in in terms of the cost. You know, there's no way that we could have developed our cities and grown our cities without steel. I mean, that's just been an essential building block, but as, but it's come at the expense of our air and our water. Right, right. Interesting. Um, so this this last film we're going to watch um, is it's a film that's about pollution and it's made for school kids, and it kind of explains what are the what are the pollutants. Uh, it's called It's an Ill Wind, and it's uh, it's pretty entertaining. It's animated. Um, and so we can watch that, and then we'll talk more about that, about the film, and then in general. And also, if you have questions uh, for our expert, uh, please put them in the comments, and um, would love to get some questions going. So here we go. Let me...
European. Expedition all set for takeoff tomorrow morning. reports it has sight of a promising planet. Stay tuned for further bulletins. Are we in orbit, Mr. Sludge? Yes, Captain Merrick. Excellent. Dispatch the survey team for three planetary cycles. It's been a long trip, and I hope it will prove worth the effort. Doctor, your report, please. This is the planet we are in orbit around. There are many things about this planet which are ideal for our purposes. The temperature range, the gravity, and the soil could easily support our food plants. The major stumbling block is the atmosphere. The atmosphere consists of a volume of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, a little less than 1% argon, krypton, water vapor, carbon dioxide, neon, and xenon, and trace amounts of carbon monoxide, ozone, methane, sulfur dioxide, oxides of nitrogen, carbon, clay particles, bacteria and viruses, lead, zinc, iron, copper, manganese, nickel, tin, titanium, vanadium, and so forth. But that's terrible. Those substances that you say exist in only trace amounts are essential for our survival. True enough, but there is a most encouraging phenomenon. A subtle but steady change is taking place in the atmosphere. If this change continues at its present rate, we can assume in some areas of this planet, the air will be quite suitable for our survival. Amazing. What is causing this change? Difficult though it may be to believe, it is the dominant life form who is causing it. He is deliberately increasing the content of these substances in his atmosphere, even though they are toxic to him and to most of his fellow life forms. I can't believe that. It's true. To power his machines, he burns tremendous amounts of fuel and releases the partly burned waste into the atmosphere, enriching it with lead, essential to the prevention of overactivity in our species, iron, which we need for bone development, copper for our nervous system, and vanadium to toughen our skin, zinc to protect it, and sulfur for our digestive system. The dominant life form has found many ways to enrich the atmosphere. Near the surface, and in the upper atmosphere. This particular area of the planet seems to be the worst offender, but other areas are catching up. How has he existed if he poisons his own atmosphere? 
Uh, Captain, uh, let me explain something about the dynamics of this planet's atmosphere. It is in constant motion due to several factors. Surface conditions such as irregular distribution of land and water and their diverse responses to solar radiation or the lack of them. The ability of the surface to absorb heat and greater heating at the equator than at the poles. These factors cause widely differing local states of the weather as they call it. Circulations are superimposed on other circulations creating complex movements beyond description. When air is lifted and cooled, clouds form, and they behave differently from time to time and place to place, depending upon what pollution is in the air. They can be made to rain more easily and quickly, or not to rain at all, to grow bigger, dissipate, and so forth. It's a complex and messy system. It appears that the dominant life form is not generally aware that the pollution they add could radically change the distribution of rainfall upon which their society is totally dependent. Was the air once unpolluted? No. Atmospheric pollutants have always been present in this planet's history. But the atmosphere has an excellent cleaning process to remove particle contamination. One is through rain. Water vapor in the atmosphere tends to collect on pollution particles to form droplets and crystals. By the time a raindrop falls, it is made up of a million little cloud drops. When rain or snow results, the falling precipitation catches additional particles and carries them back down to the surface. Some particles are blown against impediments by winds and filtered out. Other particles gather together until big enough to fall eventually to the surface. However, the dominant life form has discovered more and more uses for power obtained from fuel burning, and he is, in many places, putting pollutants into the air faster than the atmosphere can clean them out. Doesn't he realize he is doing this? I mean, he seems quite sophisticated technologically. He seems to ignore it. Not only does he release all these pollutants into the atmosphere, but doesn't take advantage of the atmosphere's natural ability to carry away pollutants. What do you mean? I'll show you. In most parts of this planet, the higher the altitude, the cooler the atmosphere. Warm air from the surface rises, carrying with it pollutants. Stronger winds aloft carry the pollutants away from their source and they return eventually to the surface. On other occasions, and in some places, there is an inversion. The hot air, which is now above, keeps the air below from rising. Pollutants stay where they are. Yet it is in areas like this that he built some of his most heavily industrialized and vehicle-infested cities. Because he likes sunshine, he seeks out these places where sinking air prevents clouds and forms inversions, trapping contaminants. This sinking air keeps rain from forming and the air doesn't get cleaned. Incredible. Wait, there's more. Also, he is keeping pollutants near the surface by blocking out the heat with artificial fog or smog so that the earth can't be warmed to help mix the air and disperse the pollutants. He is actually changing local weather patterns in certain parts of his planet by adding water vapor or by direct energy release. I have prepared a small demonstration. When we cool the air containing water vapor, a fog or cloud forms, but it is relatively transparent and has only a few droplets. Now let us see what happens when we introduce some pollution into the chamber and the air is cooled. See, the vapor collects around the particles, forming millions of tiny droplets, making the cloud or fog more dense and longer lasting. What are the prospects for us? What are the chances that we can inhabit this planet? Captain, my unit has prepared a projection into the future of this planet based on current trends. Proceed with your report, Lieutenant. The atmosphere of this planet, though large, is finite. There is a fixed amount of air. 
the dominant species is introducing more and more pollutants than ever in his history. And as a demand for power spreads around the planet, the planet will become more and more livable for us and less livable for the indigenous life forms. Plants in contact with pollutants like sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen suffer and die. Lung damage to the higher species, including the dominant one, is inevitable. Pollution in the upper atmosphere is more persistent since clouds and precipitation do not occur there to remove the pollutants. This layer affects the flow of energy to and from the planet and may alter the overall temperature of the planet. That's the long-range picture, but short-range lethal conditions may arise if the dominant life form continues to ignore the meteorology of his planet and the atmosphere's ability to cleanse itself of pollutants. At some given time and place, the removal, transportation, and dispersion capacity of the atmosphere drops due to high-pressure calm or on extreme heat inversions while the pollution rate remains high or increases. When this happens, and with greater and greater frequency, the pollution rate curve comes closer to the removal rate curve. Plants may have their entire life cycle interrupted, or large population areas may suffer, as has already happened more than once. We are led to the conclusion that this planet will soon be suited for our habitation and unsuited for that of its present occupants. Captain, the command ship is on the line. I'll be right there, Smear. Yes, Command. Captain Merck here. Merck, the X-27 and the X-73 have both located possible planets. You must decide whether or not your discovery is a suitable site so that we can concentrate our efforts. If you tell us it is, we'll send you half the expedition to assist you. If not... You must go and assist the X-73. Let us know as soon as possible. Well, we've heard the evidence. Is anyone here opposed to calling this planet a suitable site in the near future? I am. Why is that? Because of a fact that no survey but my own has dwelt on. We have presented this planet's dominant species as a foolish race bent on self-destruction. But there is another side to him. He's not blind. There's a widespread concern throughout this planet. His engineers are working to reduce the rate at which materials are injected into the atmosphere. There are scientists called meteorologists among those fighting to convince others to make sensible use of the atmosphere's inherent cleaning ability and pointing out that the atmosphere's self-cleaning abilities are limited and that pollution may affect the weather. Observe now this electric broadcast of one of these scientists. How do you feel about the air pollution thing? Is it as bad as everyone would have us believe? Uh, had people, when they built plants or when they located cities, thought a little bit about the relationship between what they were going to do and the ability of the environment to cope with it or to maintain itself in some reasonable condition with people there doing the things they're doing, uh, they could have avoided a lot of this. You know, the, the atmosphere has only a finite ability to absorb the material we put into it. And as we keep increasing the amount of pollution in the atmosphere, we don't increase the ability of the atmosphere to remove the pollution. And we've reached a point in the atmosphere now where we're adding pollution at a rate about equal to, or perhaps in some locations and at some times, greater than the rate at which the atmosphere can either remove it and disperse it or actually remove it from the air through rain and clouds. Very interesting indeed. They are sophisticated technologically. They are not ignoring their problems and seem to have a means to solve them. They do. These scientists know a great deal about the atmosphere. Radiation balance. The atmosphere is a, a thermodynamic engine driven by the sun and by the difference in temperature between the equator and the poles. Well, now, if you suspend a lot of dust or create a lot of artificial clouds in some, in some region in the atmosphere, the result will be a change in the distribution of energy over the surface of the Earth, both the energy coming in from the sun and the energy going out in the form of radiation through the atmosphere. And again, we aren't in a position right now, our numerical models, our theories are not good enough to tell us exactly what the consequences of this would be. 
Yes, time is running out. Well, we have all the data in our computer. Let's ask for a readout on its decision. Suggest you join X734 in depth exploration of planet they have discovered. But return here after five planetary cycles to check on developments and fate of this planet for possible future colonization. Gentlemen, we have the decision. Prepare now to join the X-73. I hope our next visit here will prove rewarding. So, um, <laughs> That's a great choice, Skip. I, I just that one just popped it off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so the uh, in case some of you that are watching are wondering, the the guy who did the voices is Roger Bowen. Roger Bowen was in the movie Mash. He played mm -hmm. Henry Blake, uh, and he was in a bunch of other things. He was a character actor, but um, also he was a conquering race of aliens that wanted to populate our planet. Um, <laughs> and I love that they're sludge aliens. <laughs> uh, analogy, you know, of, of these dirty aliens that can inhabit our polluted planet. Um, that was so brilliant. Um, so, uh, you know, back then, so that was, it actually was released in 71. I saw, I, I had seen something else that said that it was released in 77. And I realized in watching it that the copyright was 70, 71. So not, you know, like a year after in quest of cleaner air and water. Um, so, you know, there they're talking about models and models of pollutants and the ability for the atmosphere to absorb pollutants. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was so interesting that the two currents that I picked up on this film was that, you know, um, Yes, that, that, that the Earth, the pl you know, planet Earth does have the capacity, right, to sort of cleanse itself and renew itself, that there's a certain degree of pollutants, you know, naturally, right, volcanoes and wildfires, but that humans have exceeded the capacity, or sometimes we call it, call it the caring capacity, um, but that humans have gone beyond that the Earth's natural ability to sort of be in balance. Um, so I thought that was, yeah, such an interesting thing uh, about the film, and also stating that, you know, yes, we do have human civilization, and that there will be certain, you know, pollution associated with our activities. But if we're able to plan and have scientists, they can help us curb those pollutants. So, I mean, there were so many angles to this film, you know, there's the angle of morality, you know, that, you know, how can humans, you know, they're these, you know, high thinking evolved sentient beings, how do they not know they're destroying, you know, their own planet, you know, there is no planet B. Uh, on the other hand, there was this like current, you know, because it's funded by the AMS and by the National Science Foundation, right? You got to think about who's who's behind the film. And so my sense is also that it's it's kind of a promo for science, too. Oh, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so who was the 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 uh, who would have been or what I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this question. So that this was American meteorologists um, that put out this uh, film. Were they the ones that were doing this and compiling this data? And who are the scientists that are compiling and talking about this 
now? Is it still meteorologists or is it someone else? Yeah, it, it's it's everybody, everybody on board because, you know, I sort of the basic physics of what's happening with Earth's climate, you know, has been known since really well documented, you know, going back to the late, you know, 19th century. But, but the actual sort of state of the situation we've known since the late 70s and nothing dramatically has has changed except now we're in refinement you know we're in refinement um and more clarity using the models um but we've also gotten into sort of the compounding effects of everything right um and so there's a whole bevy of organizations, primarily federal agencies, um, that are involved with the collection of all this information, right? From NASA to NOAA to EPA to, um, well, the American Meteorology Associ uh, Society is, is a professional association uh, made up of members, and they promote these conferences where they release all the new and best uh, data and publications every year. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge bevy of, of organizations collecting data and then trying to figure out how those pieces are now beginning to interact with one another. And so that is a really evolving um, area of science. Fascinating. Yeah, you mentioned NASA. I was doing a project where I was digitizing a bunch of stuff for different NASA space centers, and I got to visit Goddard, which yeah. is kind of right outside of D.C., and they showed me... I mean, it's, I'm sure it's antiquated now, but they had this model of the Earth that was specifically showing everything that was happening atmospherically at that time. Mm -hmm. So everything like you would see, here's where all the forest fires are across mm -hmm. the globe. And mm -hmm. you know, there was like, whenever the satellites would gather that data, they would compile it and add it. And they'd say, well, here is where there's a sandstorm and then that's how it's gonna make its way to the United States. Yeah, yeah. Give us a sense that there's this, there's so much that's happening in on the globe and it's all affecting other things. Exactly. That's exactly right. Exactly. Right. What happens in the Sahara affects what happens with our hurricane season. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's just fascinating. Um, and, um, and, and I, but I wonder, Skip, if you could tell us a little bit about it. I mean, I love the animations, you know, what can you tell us about this time period of conveying, you know, the ominous music at the end, you know, the sun kind of eerily, you know, out of its smog, uh, but the music and, and the animations maybe were very telling of its time. Well, yeah, so that was, you know, during the early 70s. And so that's when there was a lot of talk about ecology. Mm -hmm. And specifically talking about how we were we were doomed. We, what we were doing, if we didn't straighten up, this is going to be a bad situation. Uh, so much so that I have a film that was made for uh, civil defense and for FEMA that was called uh, "You Can Survive Pollution," and it is this very. It's really scary because it basically has this guy walking around where there's nothing. There's no birds, there's nothing. And basically saying like, well, this is the world that we created uh, because of pollution. That's um, right, that's right. So it was very doomsday oriented. That's right, and Silent Spring, you know, really captures that, you know, silence, the silence of birds, right? No more birds in the neighborhoods. Um, yeah, and you know, Skip, I, you know, as someone who thinks a lot about communication of science, um, and, and you know, and, and and I love the medium of film, and now we use video a lot, short video in our work in science, and I'm just thinking, you know, what? So what happened? You know, what happened in these time periods when we were sounding the alarms? You know, and here we are, you know, in the 21st century, uh, and we're still at a standstill to some degree on some things. Now, granted, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, tremendous benefits to society. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles where, you know, in the eight, 70s and 80s, where, you know, you just, you couldn't deep, you know, you couldn't take a deep breath, it hurt so much, you know, and certainly the LA Basin is now much, much cleaner. Um, but, you know, so I wonder, you know, and there's this really brilliant piece in the New York Times called Losing Earth by Nathaniel Rich, in which he talks about that time period of 78 to 88, where we had this window of opportunity, you know, sort of this momentum building with the ecology movement of the 70s, and then what we know about physics of climate science. 
and we had this window to act and everybody seemed to be on board, right? Even the oil companies were like getting ready to prepare for um, legislation, you know, to curb emissions at that time, you know, and then politics got so enmeshed, you know, with uh, the, the Bush administrations and the clamping down of science, you know, the, the muzzling of people like Jim Hansen and things like that. And, you know, so, yeah, so I, I always struggle, you know, with the opportunities that we had um, in certain time periods to actually take really robust action. Um, and, you know, and now, you know, I see the Biden administration, you know, saying we're going to embed climate policy and climate action into every cabinet of the federal government, right? From transportation <clears throat> to Department of Commerce, Department of Interior, we need climate to be considered at all levels and all activities. Um, so that that's a huge movement that I haven't, you know, that we haven't seen before. Um, whether that materializes or not, that's another question. But. Right. Um, so, I mean, the fact that you have uh, insurance companies and you have, um, entities who are looking at this data, this climate uh, change data and saying, well, we can't insure you for that. We're not gonna insure your, your houses on the beach because we know how prone they are to hurricanes or we know that the water is rising. I mean, are those factors that will change industry and will change us because we don't have a choice? That's right. That's right. I mean, I don't think that we can move fast enough to keep pace right now with sea level rise, especially in the, um, Peninsular Florida, um, you know, the Gulf states. Um, yeah, and I think there was something in the news recently about the outer banks, you know, industry, you know, the insurance industry saying, look, wait a minute, you know, you're going to flush out the system because the, the just the amount of extreme events up and coming and on the horizon now causing more of these billion dollar disasters, you know, that's what... Um, NASA now tracks NOAA and, and tracks these billion dollar events and they're just proliferating throughout the Southeast region in particular is, is a big hot spot. Um, so I think, I think just the markets, uh, the insurance industries, um, they've been on board. I wish they would be more vocal about it. Um, I wish they would, <laughs> they're, they're, that, that angle would get more into the news. Um, yeah. And also, so something I've been reading is the speculation uh, that oil companies might start creating technologies to uh, capture carbon. Have you have you read this about the ideas that they would be using some of their technologies to like pull that carbon out and then they would charge governments for it or they would figure out ways to monetize that. Yeah, yeah, I, there, there has been, yes, there has been a lot of talk of that. I I, I don't know how that's really a long-term strategy. Um, I don't think it poises us to meet uh, the requirements under the Paris Agreement. Uh, you know, I think all indications point that all the models have even maybe perhaps we've been underestimating the impacts of, of, of climate change and that to keep us really below that two degree of warming um, to the end of the century is, is going to be really, really difficult. So I, I just don't see it happening. I think that we have some other, I, you can see the new emerging technologies really take over the market, things like electric vehicles. Um, there's going to be a huge infusion of um, from the current uh, COVID relief bill into public transportation. So, you know, I think really moving us out of cars, and I think that the car industry uh, in particular uh, just sees the writing on the wall. Um, so you have companies like GM making statements like, yeah, yeah, we're going to begin complying um, with the curbing of, of gasoline. And so where do we sit when it comes to uh, other countries in regards to climate change? Like, you know, we, around the 70s, we were like, we're number one, <laughs> we're the best, we're, we have the best technology, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. uh, maybe that's not the case now? I think, you know, I think we've, we lost a lot, a lot of time um, in the last administration, um, you know, and to get the wheels back up and running, takes also a lot of time. Um, you know, uh, there's been a massive uh, 
massive emptying out of the federal workforce, you know, and play in really important agencies like, you know, the EPA and Department of Interior and, uh, and NOAA. And so to get back up and running, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons, too, that I think the Biden administration said, I'm going to tap all those experts that were really pushing for climate um, emissions control from the Obama administration, I'm going to get them in those really high level cabinet positions because they can just get up and running um, because of the lost time. Um, I mean, absolutely, we're a leader in terms of our policies and in terms of our technology innovation. Um, and we can certainly use that to our advantage, um, but to be a leader in that sense. But I think that we, we, we um, defaulted on that responsibility. Uh, I'm, I'm putting in the comments uh, any questions for you, um, because you. Uh, so, what is uh, what are things that that you do in your position? Um, I'm sure you have conferences about this, but what are the things that you you do yeah. related to that? Yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we are we are concerned with the ecosystems right now. So. Fish, wildlife, water, uh, forest systems, uh, grassland systems, all those sort of ecosystems. We're thinking about how those systems are going to be responding to climate change in the next few decades. Um, and and what are the what are the what's the climate data information that managers need to basically make planning decisions into the future? Um, so do we need to start preparing? Um, a forest system to become something else because those forests are now intolerable to the rising temperatures. Uh, what do we need to do to prepare species to be able to move and migrate? Uh, you know, and, and one of the tools we use to communicate that is, you know, the ecosystem services, the fact that all these ecosystems, the natural world from, from these movies provide the ability to mitigate climate, right? The fact that canopy, tree canopies provide shade and cooling effects. And so we are also really tasked with trying to convey the importance of um, the services that are provided by ecosystems. And what happens if we lose those? What happens to the ability of human communities and other species to adapt? Um, so one of the one of the things we're really worried about is in the in particular in the Carolinas and other parts of the Southeast are rising uh, summer temperatures above 95 degrees and especially warming nights. So all of us, all species need the ability to cool at night, but now the Southeast is rising in those nighttime temperatures and we're not able to cool ourselves down. So that's that poses real important questions about like the agricultural industry, the farm workers, um, how do we move that product to market? Um, so those are the things that we're, that we're concerned about um, and studying, but also equipping um, people on the ground to be able to have the information they need to make those decisions. Nice. All right. I'm going to quickly go to another computer and see if anybody on Facebook has any questions. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> All right. That's what happens when you have multiple computers. Um, so... We, we talked about a lot of serious stuff here. Is there, I don't know, is there a, a thing since it's Friday and it's the end of the day, something that we can look forward to? There is, is there any, even the slightest glimpse of hope in some regards? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, so many young people, um, the students at NC State, you know, are so passionate about all these topics. And what I say to them is any field you go into, you'll find a way to intersect with helping the climate, whether it's in business, whether it's in insurance, uh, whether it's in ecology or the humanities, there's always some way. And I, you know, I just never give up on the ability of human ingenuity. Um, and we, we're already seeing that. And we know that we can adapt quite quickly. We can retool we can shift technologies. And I think that there is a lot of hope um, in changing um, the aspects that fuel our economy um, to think about ways that, that don't negatively affect uh, the climate system. Nice. Um, so here's a fantasy thing. So if the giant volcanoes in Yos Yosemite explode 
and there's suddenly you know like two years of darkness <laughs> because of all the soot yeah um will that positively impact us <laughs> No, no, it's it's true. They they you can see this in the graphs that, that you know Pinatubo um the Philippines um did cause a cooling and and this gets into this other topic called geoengineering. Right. right? Can we do something to the Earth's atmosphere to help cool it, uh, to help prevent those temperatures from rising and help continue that kick in of those feedback loops, right? You know, as the planet warms, the glaciers melt, the sea, the seas rise. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, the Southeast region of all the United States has been the slowest warming part of the United States. And, you know, scientists have been trying to figure out why, why is the Southeast not been warming as fast as New England or, you know, the Northern, um, states. And some people posit that it's, you know, the, the canopy cover, because the canopy cover in the southeast um, is able to, you know, absorb some of that through, you know, VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Um, so, yes, we would need probably a lot of volcanoes. But then again, you know, there are those, you know, the the pollutants from those volcanoes are not inconsequential to humans. I'm not wishing for volcanoes to completely shut down air travel oh, and, no, no. <laughs> and all that. That's exactly right. And in fact, right now, wildfires is a big concern uh, as an air pollutant, big, massive air pollutant uh, to human health. Um, and we've seen a lot of, of those wildfires increase in the West. Um, um, we did have one question here. Um, is there a finite point of no return and have we passed it? Uh, that's such a big question. I <laughs> to answer that one. Um, yeah, that's that's a huge that's a huge. I mean, you know, as I say that this, you know, this is our only, there is no planet B, this is the planet we have. Um, and I think that if we work as quickly as we can, um, you know, there's a lot of possibility um, of maintaining um, habitable earth. Um, so I you know, never give up hope. Um, there's so much to do. There's already a lot happening already. Um, that's, that's a positive. Nice. Nice. We do not want the sludge people, sludge aliens to come inhabit our planet. <laughs> that was that was so good. And I yeah, and I loved I love that piece of morality in there. You know, I think a lot of people right now, climate scientists say, you know, I'm done with the science. The science is there, it's indisputable. Right now, we just have to put forth a moral argument on doing something about climate change. Um, and uh, that's so absolutely true. Nice. Uh, Jason is is with us, and he's going to um, kind of talk about what's coming up next, I guess. I am here, and I can't wait to tell you about what's coming next. Well, first of all, thank you, Aranza Zoo and Skip. What? Um, I'm, thank you so much for the glimmers of hope there, especially at the end. That was important. Uh, but what a great conversation. Um, so a couple reminders, remember to visit avgeeks.com for more info and check out uh, AV Geeks compilations. Um, you can do that if you are making the trek to the libraries safely with your mask on and not eating inside. Um, or if you just want to use the internet like you've gotten so good at over the last 12 and a half months, um, do that too. Uh, our next show is Friday, April 16th at 3 p.m. with Jenny Campbell, who's the director of the undergraduate zoology program at, N at NC State in the, in the Department of Biological Sciences. We haven't nailed down a name for that one yet because we have so many cool opportunities. Well, but... and that's the thing is like we just did an animals one and then she's good at animals. So I'm trying to find like the sweet spot and not duplicate what I've already done. So, yeah, she speaks on. She speaks on a ton of stuff and Jenny and Aranza Zoo both are faculty members who like ask their students to make cool media projects. So they're also oh. into all this all the time. So it's really cool to have both of them. Um, but yeah, but do come and see us again on the 16th of April. That'll be, I believe, our final show of the semester too, which means oh, wow. we're going to have to start having meetings so that we can coerce you into doing this again, Skip. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Definitely. If you keep the experts coming, we've had such good experts um, and it's always it's all I always learn something. So um, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Skip, 
you know, you do such a great job of finding these these um, vintage pieces, you know, and I think that they would be so helpful to us now to resurrect these and bring them back and, and study them. Um, I think there's a lot of really good lessons in there. Right. Yep. That's what I try to do. So thank you so much, everybody. Everybody have a good uh, weekend and uh, we will see you everybody soon. Mm-hmm. <laughs>